Hey guys, so today's tutoring is going to be based on a, um, the older adult and we're going to be talking about the elderly and then I'm going to finish off talking about um, cancer. So I'm going to start off with like the easiest topic because we're kind of going back to fundies and MedSearch 1 in regards to this and basic information that um, we should already be familiar with. And then I'm going to finish off with cancer so I could kind of get more into detail with that because that's going to be mostly the majority of the information going to be asked. So this is um, a tutoring for MedSearch 2 for West Coast University, um, depending on what school you go to, um, if they split up MedSearch or not for you guys, but for West Coast University students, this is a tutoring for MedSearch 2. All right, so we're going to talk about the elderly. Basically, we're going to touch up on regular um, information that we should know. So remember that with the elderly, we kind of start dealing with chronic um, illnesses. Um, we start dealing with a decreasing immune system, decreased um, uh, kidney failure, uh, not kidney failure, but like kidney um, function. Everything starts to get low and slow for the elderly. So it is very, very important for us to always be assessing and examining our patients as well as when a patient comes into the hospital and they seem like they're kind of lost um, and you probably think, oh no, because they're probably feeling that way because, or they're probably lost because they're getting old. And yeah, no, not all the cases are always like this and it's very important for you as a nurse to be aware of that. We need to be assessing patients because sometimes due to infection, illness, medications, and multiple other reasons, patients could start getting delirium, they could start losing their memory all of a sudden. So these are things that I'm going to be talking about um, during this lecture. But do keep in mind that not everyone that starts to get old will start losing their memory because I know it's something common for everyone to say like, oh yeah, that patient is getting old. You know, that's why he doesn't forget where this and this and that are, or he doesn't remember his name. Especially if you guys get a patient that all of a sudden had a, an acute memory loss, um, that's something that you really need to monitor for because delirium could occur acutely and um, you need to further assess your patient. So I just want you guys to keep in mind during the lecture on, on that. Um, but the common chronic conditions that we usually associate ourselves with um, in the hospital, especially in the older population, we'll see hypertension, um, kidney failure, heart failure, um, coronary artery disease because of ar um, arteriosclerosis and arthrosclerosis. We might see patients with COPD, cancer, diabetes mellitus is very common, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, like I said, this is a progressive condition, so it's going to be different than a patient coming into the hospital and having an acute memory loss. So you guys do need to know the difference between Alzheimer's and delirium because it is asked, and I believe it will be asked in this exam. So the difference between Alzheimer's and delirium is that delirium is acute and it is reversible. Okay, I repeat, delirium is acute, meaning it happens all of a sudden, and it is reversible. Okay, now Alzheimer's, this is a progressive and chronic condition. It has different stages, of course, but it is progressive and not reversible. Okay, progressive and not reversible. So as healthcare providers, we're going to try to um, kind of reduce the, the patient from going from one stage to another in Alzheimer's um, quickly or like as, as fast as uh, the normal rate is. So we'll try to have them do, you know, crossword puzzles, exercises for their brain, etc. 
but none of these things will prevent them from getting a much worse um, stage of Alzheimer's. They're going to end up going through stages. Not everyone ends up in all stages of Alzheimer's um, because unfortunately they pass away or whatever the case is. Um, some patients will get into the stages quicker than others. So like I said, um, as healthcare providers, we're going to try to help these patients um, to prevent such a fast um, movement from one stage to the other. Um, and also to maintain safety. Apart from that, we have stroke, Parkinson's disease, depression, which is very, very important as well. Depression is very important to um, to monitor because a lot of these patients could have suicidal thoughts, um, you know, and we might not think it of it like much of it because apart from them not speaking up a lot about it. Um, we do have to kind of try to, you know, assess the patient, ask them, do they feel safe at home? Um, are they having any suicidal, um, suicidal ideation, things like that, because it is very common, especially in the older adult above 65 to feel that weight, especially during these times that they're trying to stay home, and etc. Okay, so we also want to assess the patients nutritionally. Because when these patients are aging, um, they stop kind of like eating, um, taking care of themselves, their ADLs. So they're like, for example, like cooking, they're not going to be able to cook or go grocery shopping because maybe they don't have help or they can't drive, etc. So um, you guys could remember the acronym SCALES uh, to assess the older adult for nutrition so you are going to be assessing um, their sadness or any mood change that you might uh, notice you also want to assess their cholesterol is their cholesterol a normal um and like you know balanced out is it normal is it high um their albumin albumin is very important because albumin is like their protein level so albumin should always be above 3.5 so you want to monitor how their albumin is. If their albumin is low, this could put them at risk for um, uh, slow wound healing, um, you know, the uh, nutritional um, deficiency in general because of low protein, energy, and stuff like that. You also want to monitor to see if the patient has lost or gained any weight, if they have any eating problems, so are they having issue, are they having dysphagia, they're having trouble swallowing, um, are they eating? Are they able to eat? Are they able to cook for themselves? If, if not, do they have someone to assist them? Um, you know, what are they eating? Are, are they unable to cook and, and with no assistance and they're just eating out of, you know, cans, which are like very high in sodium. So all of these things you do have to monitor and ask the patient because in this case, if the patient is having issues, we want to um, get a social worker involved um, and, and things like that. And then you also want to ask them if they have any shopping or food preparation problems, like I just said, if they have issues going to the grocery store, if they don't have help cooking or going or buying their, their, their food, um, you want to be aware of that. Okay. Now, another, um, assessment that you need to, uh, be aware of is, um, elderly abuse because just like, um, child abuse, the elders are abused because just think about it for kids they have to be taken care of right once you get into your elderly years you're also going to have to start getting taken care of and unfortunately there's people that you know um don't have family members and have to be taken care of by foreign pa like people like um i don't know uh clinics homes um things like that or their own family members could abuse the the elderly and sometimes abuse is not only like mistreatment as in like they get hit, but also just like negligence. Um, you know, the, the family member just neglecting the, the patient, forgetting about them, not feeding them. Um, you know, it, it's so many things that could occur. So you want to be aware that elderly abuse is something um, often seen. 
Uh, so if you get a patient and you see that they have, um, <clears throat> if they have bruises around their, their wrist and, you know, and they, they, they seem thin and their albumin level is low and their labs are bad, you want to kind of question the elderly um, patient and see what's going on. Now, I have seen questions that you guys have to be kind of um, aware about. For example, there was a question that I came across that I was in regards to an elder that um, I believe his daughter was the one that was taking, it was someone um, very close to them. I think the question was talking about the daughter or someone um, that was in charge of taking care of him. And um, when the when the patient uh, was in the hospital, the nurse noticed that he had like bruising around the wrist um, and things like that. And instead of re um, the answer being reporting to reporting the um, abuse to um, the charge nurse or, or whoever, you have to, I forgot what the question said. It was like, I know that the answer was not to report um, the abuse. It was to talk to the family member about respite care, okay? Because this question didn't technically say that the patient was um, being abused because the bruises were, like, in the wrist, which means that maybe just, like, the the, the daughter was handling the, the dad or the mom, um in a wrong way so just by pulling the patient on their wrists up like every single day it's gonna cause bruising because remember that they start getting frail and weak and stuff and they bruise easily so um I guess in that in that case you do want to speak to the family member about respite care so you do need to know what respite care is because it comes up a lot in questions and it is basically a program that they have for um the family members that take care of of like any family member um it's like a it's not like a vacation i guess but it's like days off of care so someone will come and take care of that patient while the family member is like taking time off you know and kind of recovering themselves from having to take care of this patient okay so please be aware of that because it's something that happens and occurs um, a lot and also it comes up on the exams um, a lot as well, okay? So as a nurse, you just want to make sure that you assess the patient, assess and, and talk to the patient, ask them questions. You want to perform a history and physical assessment on them, screen them for any, um, you know, safety issues. You want to interview them alone, okay? Because remember, if you have these people all together in one room, the patient is not going to tell you, yes, I get abused at home right in front of the person, you know. So usually you want to um, have the patient alone when asking these questions. You want to monitor for any injuries, um, any bruises in different stages. Um, and this goes for abuse in general. And also um, know that you have to um, report the, the abuse. Okay. Now, there are alternative cares for older adults that is not um, a hospital, obviously, because if they're not sick, um, they, they're they able to go to different um, locations to, uh, like, receive help just, like, for their daily lives and things like that. So, we have the adult daycare. This is something that a patient could be dropped off on. It's just, like, daycare for kids. So, let's say that... Um, I want to take my mom to the adult daycare because, you know, I have to work and I don't want to leave her by herself. So I just drop her off. They take her, they take care of her throughout the day and then I pick her up But she lives with me and she sleeps in my house and things like that, okay? So it's basically for safety purposes just because I'm not going to be home, okay? Um, there's another one that's like the adult day health care center, which is basically also um, a day a daycare but now it's kind of like for, for um, those that need um, more health-related issue um, prob um, help. So any, like, disabilities, um, you know, um, 
treatments, anything in regards to that, they could go into a, um, an, uh, an adult day health care center. Now, we have also home health care, which is basically that we go to the patient's house. So the patient is living in their house and someone goes to their house to help them. And then we have the long-term care facilities. Basically, um, these patients could um, uh, live there um, just like home um, homes for like patients that um, don't have a health care um, giver or there's no person to take care of them and they're deteriorating or they're very sick and um, they or just people that don't have family support in general. Okay. So for health promotion, let me make sure that I'm going through everything. Um, just so I have, just so I make sure that I don't forget, just in case you guys um, by any chance get a select all that apply or a question in general about what are common findings um, in an elderly patient, every, just always think low and slow. Everything is going to get low. Everything is going to get slow. Metabolism. Um, their height. <clears throat> their, their train of thoughts. Um, their bladder capacity. Ev their hearing. Everything is going to be lower than it's supposed. Like, it's, you know, it's just getting slower. Okay? Um... So I just want you guys to keep in mind about that. Also, when you're assessing the patient, they are very high prone to being dehydrated. So you always want to uh, um, assess the skin turgor um, the, and the specific gravity in the urine uh, just to make sure that the patient is not dehydrated because the elderly do not... Um, they don't get the sense of being thirsty like we do. So they drink less water and they are, again, prone to being dehydrated and we don't want that, okay? Now for health promotion, this is mostly like patient teaching um, and it's very important for us to be teaching our elderly population about how to promote their health, okay? Because this is going to allow them, you know, to feel better, to avoid um, diseases, infections, etc., so for the health risk and screenings, we already talked about, we do the spices for the nutrition, we assess for um, depression, we assess like our regular patient, all the systems, any abuse, neglect, pain, etc. In regards to pain, patients that are elderly do not like to, um, to report pain like um, the younger population does because they feel like they are being a bother. They feel like, um, you know, it could be, it, it could cause them depression knowing that they're getting older. So if you guys do get a question in regards to that, do not get confused with the elderly having a, um, a lower threshold of pain. That's not the case. It's just that they do not like to report the pain because they're afraid to be a bother to others, okay? Um, we also want to promote immunizations. Not only the flu vaccine, but the herpes zoster, the pneumonia, uh, the pneumococcal one. Um, so make sure that you do know your immunizations. The flu, the herpes zoster, and the pneumococcal. That one is very, very important, and you guys really need to know that, okay? Um... You also want to just assess your psychosocial nutrition and injury prevention at home. Um, so you want to always um, assess the patient and talk to them about how their house is. If they have any rugs on the floor, they have to get rid of them. Now, don't get confused on if the house is carpeted and if the question says that there's a carpet on the floor, okay? If the whole entire house is carpeted, like the floor is carpet. You're not going to tell the patient that they either have to move or remove the carpet. No, um, because the whole entire floor is a carpet. But if it says that they have throw rugs or just little tiny rugs around the house, those things have to be um, gone, okay, because those are risk for fall. Um, the cables have to be um, behind something, like not, not on the floor, not under the, the rugs. 
um, what else? They should have um, rails to hold on if they have um, staircases, um, one in the bathroom, in the shower. Um, for the patients that have steps in the house, they should tape the, the floor with colored tape so they could see better. And they always should have a nightlight um, on at night just in case they have to get up and go to the restroom. Um, it's not completely dark. Okay, so those are safety risks that you guys need to know because there could be a select all that apply not only in this class, but any any time you take a test, especially for med search and things like that, that's something that comes up a lot as well. Okay, so just make sure that you know that. So polypharmacy is one of the main reasons um, that like I was talking to you guys previously about the delirium, about the patients having like acute memory loss. This is because sometimes patients are taking the same type or the same class of drugs in different types of um, in type different types of ways. For example, a doctor prescribed one type of medication and then they got an over the counter medication and then they went to the to the specialist and they didn't tell them that the um, that they were taking this certain um, drug and then that specialist ordered the the same the same type of medication but with an, a different name because remember brand names are different generic drugs are different um in the in the classes so for example a patient could be on different types of calcium channel blockers or beta blockers or whatever class it is um and they don't know because either they're not taking the medications to the doctor they're just not following up it could be so many um issues and then also they go uh to cvs walgreens target wherever and then they buy over the over the counter medications and they don't know that those medications are enhancing the effects or not allowing the other medications to work so for polypharmacy and for when you're answering questions on your exam always you always tell your patient to bring every single medication they take they're gonna they're gonna bring the whole entire bottle okay so the question might say and inform the patient to bring in a ziploc bag all the bottles of medication that they drink um in their house or um you know it, it's just basically letting the patient know to bring all the medications that they drink okay or a list or whatever the case is but it's always more important to bring the physical copy just in case the patient forgets or doesn't write it correctly whatever whatever it could be okay so i believe that's it for the older adult let me make sure let me make sure my notes that i went over everything before we go into cancer Okay, yeah. So we went over everything. Okay, yeah. Um, hold on. Where did I put? All right. So, um, unfortunately, I don't have slides for cancer, so you're gonna have to stare at the screen and listen to me speaking. Um, I'm sorry, and. I hope that I could get through this a little bit quicker um, because it's not that much information. So let's begin with this. <clears throat> All right. So for cancer, we have different types of cancer. Well, well, of course, we have different types of cancers. We could get it in different um, parts of the body. And then um, you need to know that um, metastasis occurs when it start it starts in one location and then starts to generate in other uh, or it spreads um, in another location. Okay, um, the screenings for cancer that you guys need to uh, make sure that you guys know for your exams is the mammograms, which usually it is sent annually. For women that are 40 years or older, you also have the clinical breast exam. So um, the, the women above 40 should also do it annually. 
And then those that are between the ages of 20 and 39 years old should do it every three years. Okay? Colonoscopy. This one is asked a lot. So the colonoscopy starts at age 50 and then it is done every 10 years. Okay? Now, I don't want you guys to get confused. If the question tells you that the patient has a family history of colon cancer, they are able to get screened before turning 50 years old. Okay? Make sure that you know that. Because if there is a history of colon cancer or whatever type of cancer in the family, like breast cancer or whatever, those screening exams will be done before the age, the regular age or the normal age of starting the screening exams. For example, many women that um have family history of cancer in their of breast cancer in their in their family they start their mammograms at age 35 um if they feel a lump or something in their breast um they'll have the mammogram before the age of 40 okay so just in case you guys get a question and tells you that the patient has a family history of something um you want to make sure that the answer is not incorrect if it tells you that they should do a colonoscopy if, let's say, the cancer is, um, the family cancer history is um, colon cancer, okay? Now, uh, fecal occult blood tests, this is done annually for, um, for everyone of all ages. The rectal exam is the one that is for men, and it starts after 50. And then those are the ones that you kind of you you need to you need to know, okay. Um, let me see. So for classifying cancer, we have benign, and then we have malignant tumors. Um. So for benign, um, basically these these uh these cancers usually don't spread, um, and they don't invade nearby tissues, whereas malignant tissues um malignant uh cancer does and these are the ones that most likely metastasize um in other areas of the body okay um let's see i want to kind of like i don't want to bombard you guys with a lot of information because um during this lecture they do talk a lot but they don't really ask um so specifically because you guys are not going to go into pathophysiology again it's just the basic stuff um especially for the nurses okay so one thing that you guys do need to know is the classification um of of cancer so let me see what is in my notes so crazy of so many things everywhere Okay, sorry. So it's basically like the classification or like the staging of cancer. So it's T as in Tom, N as in Nancy, M as in Mary, and then T and then a little S. Okay, so the first T stands for tumor. The N stands for lymph nodes. The M stands for metastasis. And the TS is if the tumor is situ, um, which is spelled S-I-T-O. This means if the tumor is situated in one location or has it um, invaded nearby tissue or has it, ha, um, you know, is it somewhere else, okay? So the TNM classification is basically the way that doctors and nurses and healthcare providers are able to, it's basically like you calling ISBAR. Okay, it's like the way to let a doctor know or explain where this tumor is located. Okay, so for example, if you have, um, let me see if I have an example. I don't think I do, unfortunately. <sighs> no, I don't. Why do I not have one? I do not know. All right. Oh, I think I have it in these notes. I have so many notes to tell you this place. Hold on. There we go. Okay. So, we're going to start off with the first T. All right. So, 
If the first T has a zero next to it, this means that there is no evidence of a primary tumor in the patient. If the T has a number one, a number two, a number three, or a number four, it's basically um, explaining the tumor size and um, uh, the tumor size of what has been found. And then it ha if it has an X on the side, it's just saying that it cannot be measured, that there's a tumor, but there it cannot be measured. Okay, and I do not want you guys to get so confused, like going crazy about this because you guys are not really going to get asked about this. You just need to know that the T stands for the primary tumor, the N stands for lymph nodes. So how many lymph nodes are associated with this tumor? So if you see N0, this means that there's no evidence of any lymph nodes being associated with the tumor. If you see an N with one, um, one, two, three, or four next to it, um, it's basically explaining how many lymph nodes are associated. And then if it has an X next to the N, that means that we're unable to assess it. Okay. Now for the M is metastasis. So it's basically telling you has this cancer metastasized or not. Okay. So if it's M, um, M0, there's no evidence of metastasis. If it's M1, 2, 3, or 4, this means that there is metastasis involved and it's basically um, showing the degree of it. And then if it's MX, means that it is not, it cannot be determined. Like I said, if you guys need to look it up, um, just so you guys have a visual of it, I recommend you guys doing it. You guys can look up TNM classification system. But like I said, you do not need to go into depth. I just want to let you know, just in case you are curious about um, how it works. Okay. Um, all right. So we went through staging. Now, I do recommend you guys knowing the signs and warning signs about cancer. So use the acronym CAUTION, okay? It will stand for change in bowel or bladder habits. A is for a sore that does not heal. U is for unusual bleeding or discharge from any body, um, body like parts. I is for indigestion or difficulty swallowing. O is for obvious change in a wart or mole. So basically this one, if you guys remember going back into fundamentals when you guys were going over like the skin lesions, usually when um, you guys are using the ABCDE classification um, for, the, for the lesions, if you see that the lesion is, um, it, it has an irregular border, um, this is something very um, common that it could be a, a cancerous lesion, okay? And then um, finally, the N for caution is nagging cough or hoarseness. That's mostly associated with like thyroid cancer, lung cancer, and things like that. Um, but it's something very common, okay? All right, so we went over that. Let me see what else I have for you guys. All right, so for cancer treatments, we have chemotherapy and we have radiation therapy. Um, chemotherapy comes in different forms. We could give it IV. We could also give it in pill form. We also have radiation. We have different types of radiation. We have proton um, proton radiation. We have ster um, sterile something radiation. There's so many different types. So it all depends on what cancer the patient has and what the doctor believes that is the best thing. Now, just um, as a nurse, you just want to make sure that you are just assessing the patient when they are going into these treatments and knowing um, what are common findings. For example, when a patient is in chemotherapy or radiation, they might um, have stomatitis, mucositis, or esophagitis, um, which is like irritation of the mouth, the mucous membranes, the esophagus. So as a nurse, you want to inform the patient that they should not eat any spicy or acidic foods. And when they're eating, it shouldn't be too hot or too cold. They should eat bland um, or soft foods so it doesn't hurt them. They should always clean their mouth and maintain the oral cavity clean and moist. 
and they should not smoke or drink alcohol. Okay, <clears throat> that's one of the common signs. Another common sign is nausea and vomiting. So for testing purposes, you need to know that we give medication before chemotherapy or radiation 30 minutes prior to their, um, their treatment. So a common medication that is given is called ondocitron, um, and basically it's for the treatment of nausea and vomiting. So we will tell the patient to uh, drink that medication 30 minutes before their treatment, and they also could um, eat some, some dry crackers that will help them with the nausea, okay? And they could do this um, after the treatment as well, okay? Anorexia is something very common as well, which is weight loss diarrhea or constipation. Constipation is a little bit more associated with um, chemotherapy that are in pill form um, or, or or radiation or chemotherapy of the of the stomach and stuff like that. Then um, you might see anemia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia because of you know these chemotherapy medications or radiation. And then another main main thing is atopesia. Okay, so this is basically like the falling of the hair. It's very common. Everyone knows about it. So um, a few questions can come from alopecia. And it's mostly like what can you do as a nurse to help your patient in regards to this, um, this you know, complication of treatment. So you want to tell the patient that they need to cover their scalp. Um, they need to use sunscreen. You need to help them with self-image. So in regards to this, you could help them pick out a wig, um, you know, uh, you know uh, talk to them about uh, buying a wig and things like that. I know it sounds weird, but honestly, that's, I got a, I had a question in regards to that. So, and the answer was helping the patient pick out a wig um, before all her hair fell out. Uh, fell out. Um, you do have to tell them that they have to review, um, avoid any use of like uh, hair dryer, curlers, anything that's electric. Um, also, uh, avoiding excessive shampooing, brushing, and combing of the head. They should, um, they should if, if you know that these patients are going to lose the hair, um, they should cut it before the treatment. Um, just for self-image purposes and, and for decrease, uh, decreasing uh, depression. And then um, you also have to help them cope. Okay. And I believe that is um, the complications. Okay. Another very important complication that you guys need to know is neutropenia. So neutropenia starts to occur when the white blood cells of the patient start to fall below 5,000, okay? So if the patient's white blood cell is below 5,000, this is a neutropenic patient, and we have to put them on neutropenic um, precautions. So in this case, we are a danger to the patient because the patient is at a very, very high risk of infection. So when you're taking the test and you know that the patient is a neutropenic precaution, you have to make sure that you and everyone else are a danger to the patient. Therefore, this patient can only have their own equipment in their room. No one that is sick is allowed in the room. Okay. There should not be any fresh flowers in the room. The patient cannot eat any raw vegetables or fresh fruit, so nothing that is not cooked. Um, all the equipment, like I said, has to be in the room. And you always have to monitor their temperature and vital signs just in case to monitor um, for infection. These patients have to stay away from large crowds, and they should wear a mask when they, um, they leave the room. Or if they go home and stuff like that, they should always wear a mask because they have to protect themselves. Okay? And then lastly, we're going to go and talk about um, the radiation. Okay? Um, because that is very, very important for you guys to know. And the radiations that we're going to go over is... Um, 
just like the regular radiation and then the brachytherapy radiation, okay? So, your radiation treatment, like I said, there's very different, there's different types of radiations. So, um, it could be like a targeted radiation, it could be a proton radiation, it's, it's very, um, it's very different. Um, so, the one that I want you guys to focus on is the brachytherapy because this one is the one that they ask a lot because now the patient is a harm to us, okay? Because these patients are going to have implanted um, radiation beams inside them, okay? So for your exam, you guys need to know that the brachytherapy patients are, are um, we are at risk of being radiated or they're they are a harm to us so um when you have a brachytherapy patient they're going to have their own room no one else is going to be there not even another patient that's going through brachytherapy it's going to be a private room nothing that it's taken out of that um that is used in that room can be taken out nothing not the bend linens not the blood pressure cuff, nothing. The stethoscopes are going to, uh, there's going to be a designated stethoscope. Everything is going to be designated for that patient and it's going to stay there. Everyone that is a worker there, all the personnel, they have to wear their radiation badge because they need to see how much um, radiation they're getting. And every time that you go there, you should not be more than 30 minutes. Therefore, if you have to do multiple things, give the patient medication, everything, you want to gather everything together and go in one time to do everything, okay? These patients can have visitors, but the visitors cannot be pregnant, and they cannot be under 18, and they cannot be more than 30 minutes and they have to uh, they have to be six feet apart from from the patient. Okay, now um, it is very important that there is a lead container and tongs in the room. Okay, do not forget that the container has to be a lead container and tongs. Okay, because if by any chance these patients get up or something, and one of those radiation beams. Um, get out of their body like come out of their body because usually the brachytherapy is like inserted vaginally um, rectally um, in, in areas where it could come out um, if by any chance you get a question that the brachytherapy or whatever the radiation thing um, came out you have to pick it up with the tongs and put it into the lead container okay now another thing that I want to be clear on is I mentioned that nothing could come out of that patient's room, but you guys need to read the question. There was a question that got a lot of people, and to be honest, I picked the choice, the, the correct choice, because the other ones didn't make sense, but a lot of people didn't because they just thought that it was wrong. Um, it was in regards to a patient that had brachytherapy, and they had to change their bed because they just had to do a bed change. And the answer choice was put the bed linens outside of the patient's room in a designated container. That is correct because it's a, it, the, the answer choice is telling you that it's a designated container. Okay, so it's a container specifically for patients that, had, um, that have radiation. Um, because if you think about it, um, there, there's... They're going to have to do the, the, the change, and when we have different patients, we have to clean the room and take everything out and stuff like that. So as long as the answer choice says that it's a designated area, then it's correct. But again, read all the choices. For me, that question, the other choices didn't make sense. Um, so the only one that I honestly thought that would be correct would be that one, but just in case. Now, um... So that was brachytherapy. We already went over everything. The, the door has, has to be always closed. Um, and that's basically it. Okay, so back to radiation. Radiation, um, the patient is not really a threat to us in regards to that because they're not, um, they're not going to give us a give off radiation. But um, for testing purposes, you do want to tell the patient that... Um, they shouldn't use the same towel as their family members. 
uh, when they use the restroom, they should flush more than once. Um, I think it was two or three times that they should um, that they should flush um, the toilet. Um, they should prepare everything like um, like separately um, because there are there are situa there are situations that they could be um, able to tra like trespass that that radiation that they're receiving. But like I said again, the one that needs to um, be very like they're obviously not gonna go home, but um, the patients with brachytherapy are the ones that are really a threat to um, other other people. Okay, um, I think that's it for the lecture. Make sure that you guys know your lab values for hemoglobin, hematocrit, your red blood cells, your white blood cells, your platelets. Um, just in case, because uh, they do go hand in hand with this topic. Um, let me just make sure that I went over everything that you guys need to know, and I believe. So make sure that you guys know about the uh, neutropenic precautions that I spoke about, and yeah, that's basically it. All right. So, if you guys have any questions, like always, I do recommend you guys commenting down below, um, and I'll I'll help you guys as soon as I see the the the, the questions. Um, if I don't answer quickly here on YouTube, you guys could always go to my Instagram and um, DM me, and um, I'll probably see it quicker than a comment down here. But it's up to you, whatever makes you feel comfortable. Um, and like always, I hope that this helped. Um, and I wish you guys the best of luck in your upcoming quiz.